Good morning. We invite you to stand with us as we begin our worship together. seated. Well, we want to say welcome and good morning to uh, East Old Baptist Church this morning. A good place to grow together. Good to see you join with us. And I know we have a few people joining with us online, so welcome to those folks that are joining online as well. A couple uh, things to announce this morning. Uh, this afternoon, there's two things happening. Uh, there's an ABA uh, Central Alberta Missions event that's happening out in Troshu. And uh, if you attended the last one or heard about the last one, it is a fantastic event to go and see. We'll have a, a few of the missionaries. Uh, they will be there from uh, Chain Love in Brazil. Uh, we have speakers from the Cameroon, uh, as well as our missionaries in Romania. So right close, to, uh, right close to the Ukraine and dealing with some of the refugees that come through as well. So, uh, you're going to be able to hear from those uh, folks. That's 4 o'clock out at uh, Troshu Baptist Church. And uh, uh, they will have the presentation first and then a supper that, that follows. Uh, so if you would like to attend that, please uh, uh, put that on the roster. It is a fantastic event to be able to go to. We also have happening over at Reed Ranch a uh, community potluck. And uh, the invitation there is for 5 o'clock to bring a dish to share. So if you're not out at... Uh, eating at one place, you got a place to eat at a second one uh, at the Reed Ranch School. A couple other announcements. Uh, reminder for next week that uh, that's daylight savings time, so we will fall back an hour. You can show up an hour early. There's nothing ever wrong with that when you come to church, but uh, fall, fall back an hour uh, for next Sunday. Uh, Samaritan's Purse, if you note in your bulletin as well, Samaritan's Purse, the shoe boxes are available at the back. And even though it doesn't seem like we're, we're crunching into winter, I'm sure it's going to change on us eventually. Uh, but uh, shoe boxes, uh, their collection date is November 14th, so just two weeks. Uh, or uh, on the, uh, the week of the 14th to the 20th is the collection time. And, uh, and as well, November 27th, 5 o'clock, uh, here at the church is uh, our congregational meeting, and that's uh, uh, our business meeting. And it's an invitation for all who would like to come, uh, to come and join in and see what the church is doing. Uh, it's some follow-up from what we had uh, set in place back in January, so a good question and answer time as well. Uh, any uh, announcements we need to draw attention to this morning?
Over this past month, we have been uh, inviting you as a congregation to show your appreciation towards Pastor James and Pastor Chris. And so there are some boxes out in the back in the foyer that you're welcome to put in a, uh, a small gift or token of your appreciation, a letter or a card. And I'd like to call Chris up as well as Pastor James and present to you a, uh, a small token from the, the Church Leadership Council and the, uh, the rest of you. If you still would like to uh, express your your thanks to both Pastor Chris and Pastor James. Those boxes will still be there, or you can give them to them at their, their homes or their places of, of, uh, of work if you want to come out to the church sometime. And just uh, say how much you appreciate their, their ministries to um, yourself, your family, and to the church at large. Pastor Chris, thank you for all that you do in the, uh, the technical side and the youth side of the church. Pastor James, we thank you very much for his time. For your uh, your ministry here. Thank you all to those who have brought some uh, things for them. There's some boxes at the back, as I say, you guys can pick those up and uh, enjoy them for the uh, for the week. Okay. You may have may or may not have noticed my voice is a little deeper today, so I'm, I uh, seem to be still battling that cough that I've had for the last couple of weeks. So uh, I'm just keeping a little bit of, little bit of distance this morning. Um, we'll have an uh, opportunity in a little bit for uh, a uh, share time. So think about the uh, prayer requests or praise items that uh, you would like to share. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 33 this morning, verses 1 to 5, and then I'm going to jump over to 20, 20 to 22. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I'm going to invite you to stand with us for uh, these next few songs um, in worship. And uh, if you are get tired or are of the age of 65 or over and need to sit, that's fine too. Or whatever age you pick.
Father, thank you for being a holy God, and it is you this morning that we come to worship. Lord, we are grateful for the many, many blessings that you give us, for the privilege that we have to meet together um, in freedom here in this, this place of worship. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to each heart this morning, that you would um, clear our, our minds and our souls of all the, the turmoil that tends to run around there, that you would let us hear your voice and that you would encourage and renew us today. Lord, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ.
We want to give you opportunity this morning to uh, share a praise item or a prayer item uh, for a prayer and share time. Praise item, prayer item. Right here, Debbie. And Debbie, and that was a prayer for little Beckett, who was in ICU just after his birth. And uh, it really does speak to the power of prayer. When we, uh, when we pray, when God's people pray, uh, God hears and uh, was merciful. And so we, uh, yeah, we do rejoice that little Beckett is, is able to be at home. Thank you, Debbie. you for that. That is a, uh, that's a big event when it happens in front of a crowd of people to see someone, uh, someone fall to the ground having a heart attack, uh, and then even to have the wherewithal to, to pray with the kids and uh, to bring that before uh, the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord, that, is, uh, that is a tremendous, uh, that is tremendous timing. That's God-given timing, uh, God-given appointment in times of, of stress and trial. And so, yeah, we do want to lift up uh, Coach Dennis, uh, who had a heart attack, as well as the, uh, the effects that that had on, on uh, those that were there on the field. Absolutely, thank you so much for sharing that. Someone else? Praise item, prayer item. We may have seen uh, Karen is going to be going in for, uh, for heart surgery this Wednesday, so we want to lift her up in prayer. She's been bumped uh, once, so we want to pray specifically. She doesn't get bumped a second time. 
and yeah, that she's able to, uh, to go with, through with a surgery. It seems like the common one to have valves replaced. There's always uh, spare parts that are around and, and a number of folks have gone through that uh, here in the church. So we just want to lift her up uh, before the Lord in prayer this morning as she anticipates that, that God would give her uh, a peace as she goes into that surgery on Wednesday and uh, prayer for good recovery afterwards. I know Lauren is, he's engaged. He's, uh, he's gonna be primary caregiver and, uh, and so we need to lift him up as well, so. Anyone else? Pastor Chris? So prayer for our school and for our teachers, and really uh, we do need to keep uh, our teachers and our students uh, in prayer all the time. And, and prayer for our nation as well, as uh, uh, things get back to normal, and normal looks a lot different. And uh, so we want to be able to pray for our nation as well as it adjusts back and uh, into, uh, into the new normal. Someone else? Well, I'm going to pray for all those who have health concerns, including myself with this lingering cough uh, that seems to be hanging around. I've talked to a number of people, and uh, I've got a number of home remedies. Hopefully none of those home remedies uh, take me out as I try them, but uh, anything to get rid of some of the, uh, the cough. Um, and, uh, but as well, there's other folks that we need to lift up uh, struggling with health concerns. Uh, we want to remember Kieran and uh, Gary Rock Bill, uh, Sofer, um, uh, Brian Wosley, Dennis, we want to remember you as well as you wrestle with some of the pain of Diane uh, as well, uh, Nesbitt. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks. Lord, you are a, a God who hears our prayer. Lord, you love it when we come before you with our prayers and our petitions. And uh, Father, you love it because you love the communication and you love the connection that happens. And, and Lord, so we give you thanks for the answered prayer with little Beckett as you restored his health and brought him out of the ICU. Father, we, we uh, give you thanks as well for the response that was able to, to happen for Coach Dennis on, uh, on the field after a football game, having a heart attack, but also having all of those people to be able to come and not just give him uh, physical aid, but Lord, to be able to pray and uh, pray with the kids, and we just thank you for, uh, for your wisdom and your hand that uh, restored him. And uh, Father, we do pray for his recovery, and we thank you for your grace there. Lord, we lift up those with uh, health concerns that we have mentioned, and we bring uh, Karen before you this morning and ask you would uh, just give her a peace that surpasses all understanding as she anticipates this surgery, and for others as well that are either waiting or going into surgery, Father, uh, or have had surgery, Lord, we just give you thanks that, uh, that Father, you have a, a caring hand. Lord, you walk with us every step of the way. Lord, we lift up today as well our uh, teachers, our schools. Uh, Lord, we lift up our health care system. Lord, we lift up our nation before you. And, uh, Father, uh, normal seems to be a new normal, but, Lord, help us to adjust. Help us to be part of the solution. Uh, as we move forward as a, as a country and as a people. So, we, Lord, we lift these things before you this morning, we pray. Amen. So if you are between the ages of three and grade six, you are dismissed. And if you are the helpers and teachers, you are dismissed out the back. Uh, between the ages of three and grade six. (coughs) 
when our uh, son Thomas was, I don't know if it was 13 or 14, uh, he encountered some trouble with his knees, at least we thought it was his knees. And uh, he was an avid hockey player playing minor hockey and, and uh, he had come through a, a little bit of a, a plateau in his, in his growth. He had kind of been steady at the same spot for a little while and then all of a sudden he began to sprout up. And, uh, and as he sprouted up, a, a condition occurred with his knees, at least we thought it was his knees. It was actually a, a condition called Osgood Schlatter's. And uh, the doctor told us that couch potatoes don't get this, uh, have this happen to them. But uh, Osgood Schlatter's is a condition that, that happens when your bones grow faster than your muscles allow them to. And so what happens is, and especially in Thomas's case, is being a young hockey player and, and uh, having fairly muscular legs for skating and the such, uh, the bones grow, but the muscle pulls on the tendon. So just over the kneecap, just on the bottom, where the, uh, where the tendon attaches to the bone in your leg, uh, that was pulling. And in fact, his muscle was pulling his tendon away from his bone. And uh, so it caused a lot of pain. And uh, he couldn't kneel down. He had trouble skating. He didn't know what was going on. Uh, but he did grow that year six inches. And uh, so that's quite a little spurt for him to grow. And his muscles, being fit, didn't necessarily want to stretch along with the growth spurt. So he had a condition called the Osgood Schlatter's. And I don't know what was more painful, if it was having, the, uh, having this happen to him or the remedy for it. So the doctor, I remember when we took him into the hospital and we were looking at it, and the doctor said, this is what's going on. And he said, Thomas, don't worry. He said, if you were a couch potato, this would never happen. But it's because you got some muscle on you this is happening, so here's the solution. You can't play hockey for a few weeks. I don't know if the pain in his knees was worse than hearing that news. I think it was the news. He was demoralized. What do you mean? I can't play. My team is out there. I've got to go help them. And so he, he was benched effectively. And he was benched because of growing pains. Growing pains come in all forms and shapes and sizes as, as kids grow into adults. But likewise, as adults, as, as people who have, have asked Christ to be their Savior, as believers, we can experience growing pains in our spiritual lives as well. And this is what we're going to look at this morning. Sometimes it's in those plateaus of life that God gives us opportunity for growth. This was the case for the recipients of the book of Hebrews. And if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to read there in a little bit, verses 11 through to 14. But this was a case for the recipients of the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Hebrews is actually less of a, of a book. We call it a book as it's a book in the Bible, but it's more of a sermon that was written to Jewish Christians, the converts to Christianity that, that were Jews, hence the name Hebrews, because Jews are called Hebrews. And we don't know the author of the book of Hebrews or the date. Many speculate it might have been Barnabas and uh, possibly around the, the year 70 AD. So this is quite a while, 30 years after the death of Christ. And the purpose of this letter was to, to address this group of converts who it seems had come to a plateau in their spiritual life. At one time they had suffered great persecution for their faith and they had stood strong. But now, years later, they weren't sure anymore. They weren't sure anymore if it was all worthwhile and they were questioning. They were wondering, they were contemplating all kinds of things. See, the struggles had eased up, and they had time on their hands to mull things over. And in that time, they had grown uncertain of their faith. They plateaued. Have you ever been there on a plateau? Plateaus are interesting places. Physically, a plateau is a flat stretch of land, no hills, no valleys. Plateaus make great farmland. 
Because you can go corner to corner, pin to pin, no trees. Just nice flat territory. Spiritually, however, plateaus are times when there are no uphill battles to be fought. No downhill valleys that cause us to stumble. And by all appearances, they should allow us to traverse the land with great ease. <clears throat> plateaus should be the easiest times of our life, yet it's in these plateaus of life that believers often will get tripped up by their own doing. On plateaus, you might, uh, you might have time to think about all the things, all kinds of things, and, and wonder about them. Plateaus, there's nothing pressing. There's no pressure, so it's easy to look over at your neighbor's place because there's nothing pressing anymore. It's easy to look over at your neighbor's place and look at what they have. Plateaus are great places to discover the lost art of coveting. Looking at what someone else has and wondering if you should have it too. Plateaus are great places to, to think and to wonder, to contemplate the things of the, that the world seems to be thinking about. Plateaus, when there's nothing really pressing side from the sides, we begin to look at what the world puts value on. Look at the things of the world that we live in. And we begin to wonder about them and wonder how they might apply to us. And we begin to look at things like fortune and, and fame and, and flirting. See, plateaus are the easiest ground to cover, yet, when, yet it is when seem, things seem to be going the easiest that unfortunately it's also the time our faith can grow the weakest. And that's where the danger lies in plateaus. And that's what was happening to some of the Hebrew Christians. Life was good. They had come through the storms. They had come through the fires. They had come through. They had, they had stood for their faith. But now they began to think and to wonder, do we really need Jesus? Do we really need Jesus? Life is good. Do we really need Jesus? Life is, is really good. Do we really need the church? You know, we can do this on our own. I'm sure if they had YouTube, they would surf and they would find all the great messages. They would find all the great speakers and they say, you know what, I don't need church because I have it right here on the internet. Barry was telling me this past week of, of a, uh, an article that was written on the new church. And it's where people sit at home and they surf uh, church to church on a Sunday morning and, and they listen to all the sermons and they pick their worship music that they want to listen to and afterwards they go, ah, I've experienced God, now I can go on with my week. And it's not that those things are not valuable. There's some fantastic messages out there. There's wonderful worship out there. But it's done at the forsaking of the body of Christ. And see, See, sometimes when we hit plateaus, we begin to ask the question, do I need Jesus? Do I need the church? And it's ironic because in the midst of, of blessing, in the midst of, of lack of trials, you've come through so much, some believers have a tendency to abandon the security of the ship and, and swim in the choppy seas for some unknown shore. It's got to be better over there. And to battle this, the entire book of Hebrews was written. Hebrews was written to reaffirm the centrality of Jesus, how he is superior, how he is greater than the Old Testament prophets, how he is our, our priest and, our, and our, our high priest and our king, that he is the ultimate sacrifice, that he is the firstborn raised from the dead. See, that's what Hebrews is, is reminding the Jewish believers of. And right here, right in the midst of, of Hebrews chapter 5, amid a warning of falling away, of wandering off, right here, we find a lifeline that is thrown to those that are in the water, those who are struggling, those who are, have wandered off, those who have, have sat down and said, I only need what's on the internet. I don't need people. In fact, people make me irritated. 
I don't want anything more to do with them. And so here in Hebrews, the author throws a lifeline. And we read Hebrews 5, verse 11 through 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, through this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk and not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. And here it is. Listen for it. Verse 14, but solid food is for the mature. Solid food is for the mature by who, uh, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And so here's the key. Plateaus in life can be the catalyst for us either to draw closer to God or farther away. So let me explain. If we are to draw closer, because we don't want to draw farther away from the Lord, if we were to draw closer, how does that happen? The reason a child moves from a diet of, of milk and solid food is, is because they are growing. It's because they're growing. Likewise, in the Christian life, everything in life can be going well. A diet of milk can really satisfy, but then something changes. Something changes in our body. We begin to grow, and we experience, grow, experience growing pains, and that's what the author is alluding to here. Growth toward maturity uh, involves moving from the milk of, of knowledge to the maturity of understanding how to apply it, and that's, that decision is ours to make. Plateaus are important opportunities that allow us to strive for more of God. The outside pressures have been eased in those times of plateau. But it's not a time to look at what someone else has, someone else's faith, someone else's church, someone else's uh, story of God. But rather it's the opportunity in those plateaus where God has removed some of those obstacles for us to grow in a deeper relationship with him. Growing pains sometimes come through that, those plateaus as we transition to a deeper walk with the Lord. There is a point in every believer's life when the elementary truths of, that were taught in Sunday school should transition into, into the solid food of understanding and discernment. So plateaus in our, in our lives are not time to sit back and ride the wave, but they are times to allow us to transition and to grow, to anticipate what God has for us. And that's what the author of Hebrews was explaining. <coughs> so how do we do that? How do we transition? How do we, how do we take advantage of those times of, of unsettledness? See, because that's also what happens in plateaus. How do, we, how do we take advantage of that? How do we grow when it seems that we have plateaued? Well, let me give you a couple thoughts. What if you were to decide to be passionately committed to Christ? If you're a believer in Christ, you have undoubtedly made a commitment to him. Maybe that was some years ago. But are you passionately committed today? Are you passionately committed to Christ? See, there's a difference between making a decision for Christ and then passionately desiring Christ in your life. And so here's a, here's a key. We get it out of Galatians chapter 5, verse 24. And this comes right after Paul identifies several acts of the sinful nature, followed by the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And then he invites believers to die to themselves. So he says, here's a sinful nature, here's the work of the Spirit, and if you want to be engaged in the work of the Spirit, you first must die to yourself. And he says, verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucified the flesh. I don't have to have my way. See, that's what crucifying the flesh 
is all about. See, we all want our way. We don't have to have our way, but rather we submit. We say, Jesus, would you have your way in my life? So those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the, the flesh with its pass passions and desires. And verse 25 says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If you belong to Jesus, then the desires of the flesh are gone. They've been crucified. They're nailed to the cross. They might rear their head, but they've been nailed to the cross. They've been covered by the blood of Christ. That means you have freedom. You're not bound, bound by sin's chains, but you are free because of the cross. And let, that lets you shake free all that holds you back so that you can become the person God is calling you to be. It allows you to be passionately committed, not just averagely committed or minorly committed. If you were to put your, your relationship with Christ on a scale, uh, where would you be? If the low end of it was moderately committed, every now and again I might throw, uh, I might throw God a bone. You know, I still think about you, God. Maybe in the middle is... Is, uh, is I, I attend church regularly, I fellowship with believers. And maybe passionately is, is where you go, this, this extends not just for me, but it, it extends outward. And the series we're in is, is called Up and, and Out. There's a, an up relationship with the Lord, but there's also an out relationship that we're going to talk about later that, that says how we deal with people around us, how we minister to those around us. And so maybe that's on the other end of the scale. Are we taking what we know from the milk that we have been fed, are we taking that and are we applying it? See, when we apply it, sometimes we apply it in those areas of passion. Things that, that get us out of bed in the morning, that excite us. If you think your life is plateaued, use that time to grow towards Jesus with a passionate commitment. If you think your life is plateaued up to, up to going to church regularly there, you can, you can stop right there and, and plateau. But what about passion? What about a passionate commitment? Make a decision to be passionate about the Lord again. Let him make you fully alive. Let him show you where, where you can serve, where you can uh, come and, and bring the gifts that he has given you and show those to others. So the first call is to, be, is to decide to be passionately committed to Christ. Well, secondly, how do we, how do we grow when our life seems to plateau? Well, well, take up your cross and follow him. That's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And then he said to all, he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know, there's always a temptation to allow your struggles to keep you from, from really engaging God. Really allowing God to, to have full control in your life. And we say, I can't do that because, you know, I've got these struggles. I have these struggles. There's no way that I could ever uh, serve in the church or serve others. Because, you know, I have these struggles. You know, I, I'm... I don't know if anybody else knows, but I'm not perfect. Don't spread that around. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're never told that we have to have everything together before we follow God, before, before we allow God to work in our lives. As believers, we're never, we're never told that. We assume that. But that's one of the lies of the enemy. You have to have everything together before you follow Jesus. Because if you don't, oh, you're going to make a mess of things. Well, might be true. But you can make a mess of things with God. Going towards God. You know, if you're going to fall down in life, fall down as you desire to pursue God. Not as you walk away from Him. In fact, taking up your cross can be likened to acknowledging whatever struggle or shortcoming you have and then choosing to follow Jesus anyway. You know, there's no better rebuke for the devil than this. To acknowledge that you're not perfect. 
to acknowledge that you don't have it all together, that things aren't all uh, exactly the way they should be or could be. But even despite that, you say, I love Jesus anyway. And he loves me. And we know that because the scriptures tell us that. That while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. See, we accept that truth and we say we are still sinners. We are still sinners. But there are no perfect Christians. It's a newsflash. There are no perfect Christians. There are only forgiven ones. So when we come before Jesus, we say, Jesus, here I am. I, I have all my flaws, but, but if you can use me, put me to use. See, the difference is when we are forgiven, when we understand that we are forgiven, God opens the doors for us. He doesn't ask us to be perfect. He just asks us to be forgiven. So whatever your financial situation, your personal struggles, your, your attitude that might need adjusting, God knows all of it. He knows all of it and even more. And he simply wants you to acknowledge the burden. Simply to acknowledge it and let him help you carry it. Say, yeah, I struggle here. I struggle there. But I struggle and Jesus helps me. I struggle and, and the Lord lifts me up. I'm not always doing the right things and I have to ask for forgiveness. But that's what a relationship with Jesus is all about. So take up your cross. Don't let it be the excuse that keeps you on the sidelines. Take up your cross. Acknowledge the burden of sin and, and struggle that you have and choose to follow Jesus anyway. It's the perfect snub to Satan. It's a perfect way to put Satan back in his place and to say Jesus is on the throne of your life. Plateaus in life are often are also times to put what you have learned into action. <coughs> James 2, verse 2 says this, Be doers of the word, not just hearers. Plateaus are excellent terrain to, to live out what God has called you to do. What I mean is that use those times where things are going fine to live out the truths that, that you have received, that you understand, that you have heard all of these years. Use those times of plateaus to, to live those out. How can you do that? Well, well, go on a mission trip. Serve the church. Take that course in biblical studies you've been thinking about and do something with it. Pray more, show more grace, be more generous with what God has given you. And put an action behind the faith that you proclaim. Step out of the safety of, of the boat and into the flow of the Spirit. Plateaus also are places where we can look for areas that God is already at work. And this is an important one. Ask yourself the question. <coughs> what, is God, what is God working on in your life right now? Ask God that question. God, what are you working on? And if you were to, to earnestly ask that question, God, what are you working on? What is the area you know uh, just as soon as you say those words, God answers. He goes, I'm working on you right here. This is the one thing that I'm working on in your life right now. Ask God what areas he is, he is growing you in or strengthening you in. Ask God where he's at work. He has, given you, has he given you a love for a certain ministry or for certain people? Maybe he's given you a, a greater desire to learn or to grow and to study. Maybe he's given you a desire to engage in fellowship or building community. Wherever it is. Whatever God has, has set in your heart, and you know uh, just by asking that question, God, where are you at work? You know where God is at work. Not just rounding off the rough edges, but the direction he is pointing you in. He gives it to you. You know what that is. The Spirit reveals that to us. And wherever that area is, start there. 
You wonder how to grow when we encounter plateaus in life? Grow in those areas that God is already at work. Meet him where he is working. Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which he has prepared uh, for us beforehand that we should walk in them. See, God already has the things in store for us. We simply need to say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, at that area that you're, uh, that you're putting before me, and I'm actually going to take a step of faith in it. You know what? I've heard about Samaritan's Purse. I've heard about these shoe boxes that bring hope. I'm actually going to go and volunteer at Samaritan's Purse. I want to see how God is glorified, how you are glorified through that organization. Maybe it's ministry to a friend. Maybe it's just being a friend to those that you know around you. Meet with Meet God where he's already working in your life. And lastly, don't be afraid of growing pains. Don't be afraid of the growing pains. Thomas grew six inches in the matter of however long, short little time. He grew six inches. He was sort of proud of that. At the end, those growing pains, that was all right because it brought about a good result. And for a while, milk is what a baby will desire. But when solid food is introduced, a new stage of growth begins. When we put into action what God has taught us, and we do it in places where he has led us, it can bring, uh, yes, it can bring stress and anxiety and uncertainty, but it also brings great reward. See, when, when we look at some of those struggles that we face and say, God is sharpening me, God is molding me. God is shaping me into the believer that he needs me to be. See, those growing pains, those times of struggle, they're okay. They have a reward. I was at a uh, prayer breakfast this past Friday. (coughs) Pardon me, up in Sylvan Lake. And the, uh, the keynote speaker was a young Inuit man who a few years ago, asked God to let his life make a difference in the northern communities. He was Inuit. He grew up in Ottawa. And he had seen the, uh, the suicide rates, such high suicide rates, and this is back in 2017, that were, were happening in Inuit communities. Teenagers were taking their lives in, in the droves. It was an epidemic. And he wasn't sure what God was, was going to do. He was young. He was only 19. He wasn't sure what God was going to do, but he was willing to be a vessel for the Lord. And he put himself out there. He took a risk. And the Lord brought around him a team that would go with him. And the Lord brought around him 60 churches between Ottawa and someplace else in Quebec, where he grew up. 60 churches that would commit to pray for the work on the, in those Inuit communities. And the Lord gave him a message, and the message was this. It was a simple message. It was a message of hope. Hope not in all of the, uh, the programs and things that could be offered, but the hope that came that was rooted in Jesus. A hope that came through forgiveness. A hope that came through grace. And when he spoke a message of forgiveness and grace that happened in his own life, it made a difference. He woke up one morning and he said he had a dream. And the dream, in his dream, he saw a newspaper article and it said zero suicides for the year. He didn't really know what that meant. He thought it was a pretty lofty thought. But through faithfulness, In 217, in one of the communities, I think maybe it was even two, but one of the communities where they had spent a lot of time in ministry, the suicide rate went from from an extreme to zero. And the newspaper printed an article, zero suicides in this community. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that did for that young man who, who said, uh, I, I need to make a difference. God, can you go before me? And so in, in 10 years, for the first time in 10 years, the rate of suicide decreased. And in one community turned to zero. See, don't be afraid 
to go where the Lord leads you. Don't be afraid to take a step of faith and say, God, if this is where you're calling me, I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. I'm just going to go. And, and you know what? There might be some pain along the way. There might be some things that are uncomfortable along the way, but, but I'm going to go. So the message, the point this morning is this. Don't waste the plateaus. Don't waste the time when everything seems to be going great. Don't waste your time by, by looking into the world, getting caught up in what the world is caught up in. Because the world gets caught up in all kinds of things when they have no outside pressures. They're involved in all kinds of things that make no sense whatsoever. You can be a, a social activist for pretty much anything. But plateaus in our life as believers are times where God has removed all the other distractions so you can see him more clearly. Take advantage of those times when things are going good because that is a call from God for you to grow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do bring us from places of, of desiring milk and to being fed to places where we, where we step out in faith and we serve and we honor you and we, and we take those steps and Lord, uh, those can be sometimes very scary. They can even have pain involved. But Father, we know the reward is worth it all. So Father, this morning, as you have stirred by the power of your spirit, as you stirred and have, have lit upon people this morning, maybe here in the sanctuary, maybe at home, Father, in those plateaus of life, may, may you call even one to say, here am I, Lord, I will go. Lord, even one that would say, this is where I sense God leading me. And this morning, Father, we ask that you would uh, that you would come around your people, that, that maybe it isn't just one, but maybe it's many that recognize it, that we all live in a plateau. We have a safe country. We have very little to worry about. And Father, we spend so much of our time wasting, wasting it on looking around at society and getting involved in things that may make no kingdom difference at all. So Father, would you refocus us? Would you draw us back? Would you would you put our priorities back in place so that we would choose you, that we would choose to grow, and we would choose to make a difference in this world for you? We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. I'll invite you to stand with us for a singing of our closing again, please. Let's sing verses one, one and four.
Well, I'm sure as we dismiss this morning, you'll understand if I don't shake your hand and pass on what maybe we don't want passed on. So I give you my greetings uh, ahead of time. Let's bow now for the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.